Uh, Pete, I have another question. We know that, for example, that uh, the, in uh, Mughal India, there are some bows uh, made of steel, right? I mean, okay, we know, I mean, just please, and then the question is- I've got could, one, do you want to see it? <laughs> yes, please, can you show it to us? Yeah, sure. I don't know if you can. Ah, yes, I can. Yeah, that's right, exactly these ones, right. That's right. So this is um, Indian, it's, uh, oh, needs a clean, it's a bit rusty. Um, I've shot it. I made a string for it. It draws about here. Yeah. It's not a long draw. It's physically quite heavy. Um, my friend uh, Kay Copperdryer wrote uh, an article in the Journal of Archer Antiquaries about this type of bow being used as training bows for children. What's the poundage? How heavy is that? It's about uh, 50 or 60 pounds at, at 22 inches. Oh, okay. Uh, it's, it's not massively heavy, but it would, sh it would shoot like short range. And one of the things they kept these in howders on elephants and things like that. So at short range, you could put an arrow through somebody or a tiger, which is more likely, um, say up to about 50 meters. I think it's maximum range is only about 150 meters. Um, but it, it's solid, it and is. the advantage is you can stick it in a in a in a barrel with grease on it and take it out um, fifty years later, and it still works. And uh, can you bend it in the middle? No, the the middle is quite solid. It's actually screws together in the middle. Exactly, that's what yeah. I meant. Okay. Yeah, it's a it's a takedown bow. Okay. Okay. And oh, yeah, it, it can be bent. Uh, actually, it's it's feeling pretty good at the moment. It's like a sword blade, basically. Yes. Um, they um the the tips. You notice that there's not very much mass in the tips. No, I noticed that. Yeah. So that the person that made this was a a person that knew about making bows. Not not a um. He wasn't trying to make it look like. A regular bow and you can see it doesn't have it's got a recurve but it doesn't have a reflex in it really it's actually deflexed yes it's deflexed you're right and uh i think that's the, that, that's the reason it's functional because it actually you can aim quite easily with it it's got a very narrow arrow pass what kind of steel is that i don't know i think it's a uh medium carbon steel I don't think it's Woods. I have seen Woods ones. Yes, they are. Uh, and uh, a, a friend of mine has two. And one, the one edge is so sharp, we both cut ourselves on it. <laughs> this is unbelievable. And the other one is inlaid with gold. And it's so heavy that we couldn't, neither one of us could move it at all. We think it may have been made more for looks than function. This one was made for function. When I first got it, it was in two halves. And um, I was showing it to a friend and he had a, a, a tiled floor and I, I was showing and it slipped out of my hand and it landed, the half landed straight on the tip there and bounced back to my hand. Oh, yeah, it's got exactly. a lot of resilience. Yeah. So true. it's it's interesting that, uh, as I say, um, Kay said that the, uh, she was in South India where she learned this, that they, they I mean, I could see a, a small child by you know like an eight to ten year old this would be full draw for a regular draw for them yeah yeah of course, absolutely and uh the advantage is you can't break it yeah um so maybe that that was its general use and you can and use it uh, as a club in hand-to-hand -hand combat <laughs> oh yeah if this had a, if it, when this has got a string on it right it's quite rigid yes um and those those tips they, they could do a bit of damage yeah. Uh, there's a there's a report. I think it's in the Baba Namah, where he um, they're fighting some guys up in the mountains. Yeah. And it snows, and he said their steel bows broke, but we were using composite bows, and we just kept them inside our coats. And when we took them out, we could shoot. 
So uh, there, there's a disadvantage to these, which is that they're apparently sensitive to cold weather. Apparently steel crossbows are too. Um, see, the problem with metal is it gets fatigue yes. from bending all the time. So they things eventually break. Yes. Um, and uh, what we found, uh, I mean, I don't shoot this very often because I don't want it to break. Uh, no. I bought it for a friend and uh, it's, it, it's got... But I could actually probably do a little video of shooting it. I just have to find its bowstring I made for it. Oh, yeah, um, absolutely. I would love to see that. Yeah. I'll, um, I'll... Then the next question comes, why didn't they make crossbows, you know, like the arms, bow, and mm -hmm. the arms of a crossbow like that, made of steel in the Middle East or in India, you know? I think the reason was that they, these are so inefficient, comparatively speaking. If, if you're... If you're fighting somebody whose bows only shoot 200 meters, then a, a, a steel bow crossbow that can shoot 250 meters is a good thing. But if you're fighting people who can shoot 300 meters or 350 meters, then a steel crossbow isn't as good a thing. And the Middle East is generally a lot drier than Northern Europe. Yeah. So therefore, composite bows aren't as difficult to maintain. The big problem is insect damage. Um, but even so, I mean, I've got I've got a Turkish bow that's that's let's see, three hundred and twenty years old, and there's virtually no damage. I mean, you know, uh, I, I'd never string it, but it doesn't look as though it would break if you strung it. Um, I've seen older bows that were in perfect condition. I think Lucas Novotny, the bow maker, and and uh, Yarp Kopadraya actually got a seventeen hundreds Turkish bow and strung it and shot it without damaging it. So composite bows well made last a long time in the conditions they were designed for are, are pretty good. I, I must say that there possibly is too much emphasis on their sensitivity to moisture in Western literature. Yeah. I had two reasons for that. One is that in a lot of India, composite bows were used and there's a lot of absolutely terrible climatic conditions in terms of high humidity in that in India. Uh, yeah. the, a, a lot of the Indian crab bows um, actually have a layer of silver foil under the paint, and that may be how they 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 glued that on over the the horn and sinew, and then painted over it. And that may they may have been actually fairly watertight. But Adam Karpowitz, in his book uh, on Ottoman Turkish bows, talks about making bows and taking them uh, hunting in. Nova Scotia or thereabouts in wet conditions and just drying them out and having them back to normal within, you know, like 12 hours or something. Oh, as long as they didn't get soaked, but just rain and things like that. And and uh, I've got two of his bows and, and we, we in, in emails and that, we talked about various things. And, and one of the things he said was that, you know, they, um, they, can stay strung for very long times without serious deterioration. So after the first week or two of being strung, they've lost maybe 15 to 25% of their strength, but they basically stop there and they're still efficient bows. So if you start out with a 160 pound bow, you might end up with a 110 pound bow. It's still a good bow. And I left <coughs> one of the bows I got off him uh, for five weeks strung. Uh, drew it and shot it and everything. Then took the string off and it was completely deflexed, reflexed. Um, a week later, it had gone back to its complete reflex. Yeah. Like it had never had a problem. And when you see bows that come out of museums that are have that deflex, reflex shape, there is a good possibility they've been strung for more than 100 years. Yes, yes, that's right. They were strong. Because yeah. they string them and put them on wall. Yes. I mean, you look at the, the, the bows in the Dresden collection. A lot of those have got old strings on them, and they're still strung. Yeah, they're still strong, yes. So, I mean, you know, so therefore, why make steel bows if you can make bows that are better performing and almost as useful? See, the thing is... A steel bow, if you see the, 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 the guy making the composite crossbows in the European style, the brace height is about that high on a bow that's maybe a metre long. Yeah. That's and the, um, the pressure in the string 
at brace height is very, very low. Like this, when you string it, it's under fair, a, a fair amount of pressure. A composite bow, like a reflex composite bow, is under a lot of pressure. And uh, uh, I think it was the, um, the, the Dutch professor, Coy, who uh, in, in, a, in a paper pointed out that the highest stress in the bowstring is when the bow's braced, not when you pull it. Because when you pull it, the arms act as a lever and they reduce the stress in the string. Yes. Right. And I thought, this is crazy. So being me, I made a bowstring and put a bow weighing scale in the bowstring. And then I measured its draw, uh, its, its weight when it was braced, because I made the string adjustable so I could get the right brace height. And then I pulled it and looked at it and it had gone down. Like it went from 55 pounds down to 45 pounds or something like that. That's it. So in reality, um, the 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 um the stress depends on the design of the bow now i don't know what the stress is like in um european steel crossbows i think maybe todd todeskini has measured it i'm not sure yeah. i know it's a lot but it's not comparable to a composite bow because the bows aren't recurved yeah. uh, aren't reflex sorry um they they they're you, you take the string off a European steel crossbow and the tips move forward a little bit. Yes. If that was the, it, the, I've seen Korean crossbow bows in the in the museum in uh, in Seoul with strings off, they're almost a complete circle. Actually, stringing this bow and putting it on the crossbow would have been a major job. But once it was on, obviously, it's there for a long time. And the Koreans made bows with that degree of recurvature without horn bellies because the ones that I've seen so far have a bamboo core and a wooden belly sinew back but then the whole thing is spirally wrapped in sinew putting the whole thing under compression and uh, that technique of, of uh, wrapping sinew around the bow to put it all into compression that wasn't certainly known in the Middle East because Persian bows had sinew wrapped around them because you can't see the horn on, on at least two types of Persian bow. The Indian crab bows have sinew wrap all the way around them. In fact, it's so efficient, the Indian crab bows, the horn is only half the width of the limb. This, the, the, the limb is that wide, the horn is only that wide. And it still works because that shrinking sinew puts so much compression on it that it changes the material strengths. Um, this probably was dis uh, d discovered by accident, but what it means is that it would be possible to make cheap semi-composite crossbows. Yeah. And then the next question is, has anyone tried to replicate a Middle Eastern crossbow, Persian, Ottoman or whatever? I'm not sure. Um, I know that McEwen built replicas of, with horn and sinew bows of hand Chinese crossbows. He did make a, a, a replica of a Kamani Gov, okay. the oxbow, but that was a catapult. That was the three bowed giant crossbow. Yes. Uh, he made one that I think the each bow was just a simple bow with a, a, about a meter across, three bows with little pulleys, and the string went around all three bows, two face forward, one face back. And with these little bows, with all that arrangement, he got a 40 inch draw. <laughs> he, he, never, he never made a composite one, he said, because there was no point. These things already shot so well. Um, but in theory, these bows were bought by uh, Hulagu Khan and used at the Siege of Alamut. Yes. And he set these up on a neighboring mountaintop and shot across the valley into the courtyard of the castle at Alamut. Yes. So these these are serious. They're, weirdly enough, they're quite widely distributed. So there are uh, bas reliefs in Angkor Wat of Khmer with two bow versions of these on elephant back. Mm -hmm. yes. So, you know, I mean, uh, uh, Southeast Asia was strong in native crossbow design. Yes. 
So it's a lot and of the, uh, and the bow and the crossbow arms. They are also uh, of a composite nature in China or Southeast Asia. Correct? They're never made of steel. Not of steel. No. In China, they made them three different ways. You had a full composite crossbow. Yeah. Maybe four. You had. I've seen uh, on pellet bows that shoot little bullets, little round balls. Yeah. Um, pellet crossbows, not pellet bows, which are separate oh, animals. Okay. Um, I've seen that where they have a horn strip with a thick, thick thin layer, um, but with no wooden core. And there are ones that have wooden bows or bamboo bows done like a leaf spring. So you have one long bow, one shorter one, one shorter one, one shorter one, and they all work together and they move against each other. They're not glued to each other. They're just tied together. So there's a big range of design. And uh, you, you can only think that the, the reason for choosing these um, different designs was economic. It's a lot cheaper to make thousands of these leaf spring bamboo bowed crossbows than it is to make thousands of composite bows because composite bows are expensive. But as I said, in, in Korea, they went one step further and they designed these bows that didn't have a horn component. You, you, you can start out in Korea, you've got a bow that's a normal composite bow. It's got full length horn, full length sinew, ears, everything like that. But then they had what they called half horn bows where yes. the horn only went halfway up the limbs. Now that is actually very similar to crab bows in India because the horn only goes halfway up the limbs in those two. Then they had, um, they even had hand bows like that. I've handled two of them, black lacquered, bamboo core, fruit wood bellies, uh, wrapped in sinew. They look exactly like a slightly opened out horn and sinew bow in the Korean style. Um, and uh, they were, it was basically, horn was expensive. So you look for substitutes. You've got a slightly less efficient bow. Um, possibly it didn't last as long, like horn bows can last for a hundred years. Um, but it was, you could make, tens of thousands of them, and they work. That's right. Uh, how much this technology went west, I don't know. I mean, in, in the before the unification of China in the, in the Qin dynasty, in the south, in the kingdom of Chu, they were making essentially laminated bamboo bows, both for crossbows and for hand bows, so that there'd be three layers of bamboo, there'd be a, a middle layer, and they'd be glued together. Um, but whether you know, it's hard to say. There's, there's, uh, this from uh, Khotan in Central Asia. Uh, I think Oral Stein in one of his ex exhibitions found a crossbow bolt, which was local as opposed to Chinese because it was structurally different. So that that must have been fairly widely diffused. I can't imagine that nomadic tribes um, would have used crossbows because they're, they're complicated to build and you know. You can you can make a um, a composite hand bow uh, with a knife <laughs> and a saw and a glue pot, yeah. but to make a crossbow, you've got to be able to carve things out of wood and make little in intricate nuts and and levers and that. And this wasn't the kind of thing the nomads did very often. Um, but of course, when they captured cities and people made those things, they would then. Say, right, you're going to work for me. We're going over here and shoot at that city or whatever, our next, our next target of opportunity. So uh, it's not that nomads didn't understand the use of crossbows. It's just that it wasn't something they manufactured themselves. And there's a, there's a whole stream of uh, modern Chinese historical movies where people have, particularly Mongol people, have little pistol crossbows. Yes. <laughs> And, and for ages, I thought, well, where does this come from? And, and I found this big book on Mongolian culture uh, based on expeditions in the 1910s, 20s, and 30s. And it turns out these little pistol crossbows were originally for playing a game, shooting these little pieces, like knocking over dominoes or something. And you, uh, the original game was you had a little um, slotted uh, thing you held in your hand and you flicked these things and you had to hit this. They still play it. They, Mongols in Australia still play this game. 
And uh, you, I, I can't remember the name. It starts with Shu. And um, so at some time in the 19th century, uh, someone came up with the idea of making a little crossbow to shoot these little things. You know, and, this uh, is exactly what we mentioned, uh, we were talking about before. This is where gaming and military history and, you know, <laughs> are mixed together. <laughs> yeah. uh, this, this all, you know, I think it's really wonderful that some filmmaker came upon this and decided to put it in a film. Uh, some people say, oh, well, but they never really used handheld crossbows in battle. No, they didn't. But that's not the point. This is a really good looking thing to have in a movie. <laughs> I'm just... <laughs> It's it's right. Imagine so what would happen if, if somebody said, well, in cowboy movies, but bullets don't ricochet on sandy ground, but then all those cowboy movies in the desert with bullets ricocheting everywhere, well, well they're not real. It's <laughs> true, <laughs> <laughs> it's sure, it's cowboy movies, yeah, that's they do. I mean, that's all good. But as I say, these things, you know, they, they flow through. Yes, yeah, true. There's, there's a whole you know, kind of crossbow and anti-crossbow culture. I mean, you have to look at in Italy where they have the crossbow guild still uh, shooting traditional rounds with big steel crossbows. I mean, really big, powerful, 1,200 pounds, 2,000 pounds draw weight. And shooting bolts that in the middle, they're not the same um, diameter all the way through, but in the middle are this round. And they're shooting at pieces of wood at 30 and 60 metres that are like a cone driven into the target about that round at its base tapering in and they'll show you at the end of a round there'll be 20 or 30 of these giant bolts stuck in this tiny little cone so their accuracy is fantastic um it's the equivalent in rifle shooting to bench rest shooting because they have a special bench they sit on and they hold their crossbow here and it's got a little fork in front that that holds the front of the crossbow and it's it's all very formal but it doesn't detract from the fact that this is a real thing. That's true. And uh, there, there were, I think there still are, crossbow guilds in, in Belgium and places like that. Yeah. Um, and, and Germany, they had the, the, the um, shooting at this Popinjay target that was like a giant eagle formal crest. And each feather had a score on it. And you had to knock the feathers off. And depending on what feather you knocked off was part of your score. So crossbows as a sporting implement still exists in their formal traditional style. Crossbows were used for hunting long after the development of um, guns because they had two advantages. They didn't make very much noise. They do make a fair bit of noise, but nothing as loud as a gun. And um, you could reuse the ammunition. They, in Spain, I think they uh, hunted uh, mountain goats and things with them. And, uh, I mean, you know, it's not easy. It's not easy to hunt a mountain goat with a rifle with a sight, chamois or whatever they were hunting, ibex. These things, you know, run up sheer cliff faces. They're very, and, of course, the trick is if you want to get your um, mountain goat and take it home and cook it, you don't want to shoot it on the top of the cliff and have it fall down because otherwise you have mince mountain goat at the bottom of the cliff, which is totally smashed. So you want to be able to pick your shot and, and get it just at the right position so that it falls over on a ledge and then you send your servant to climb down and get it for you because you're not going to do that. Uh, and um, I mean, so it's an aristocratic sport. They use crossbows also in whaling uh, in, uh, in, in Scandinavia, I think. And they also made crossbow traps. Uh, for animals. Uh, so these were, they had a kind of um, pressure plate or something attached to a rope that was attached to a pulley that was attached to a trigger mechanism. And the crossbow was aimed so that whatever was standing on that would get hit. There were other types that were not even as sophisticated as that. The crossbow just powered a, a, a piece of wood. So the animal stuck its head through, tripped the trigger, and the crossbow rammed a piece of wood down. This is for sable and, and things like that that you want for the fur. So you don't want to puncture them, but you want to kill them. And um, so crossbows survived. I mean, they were still in use in, in Vietnam during the Vietnam War uh, because they were silent. Yes, right. Um, 
and and throughout Southeast Asia, you can still buy, you know, traditionally made crossbows, uh, mainly designed for hunting, um, and mainly with poisoned arrows because the arrows are very light; they're not going to kill. Uh, but um, there's a there's even a uniquely Australian crossbow that was developed during the Second World War that had two bars coming out the side and a ratchet running down the stock. And you cocked it by stepping the bars down the ratchet. Oh, okay. And they shot, I'm pretty certain they shot some very odd projectiles out of it. I'm not sure if they shot an explosive one. I think they might have developed an explosive one. But the thing is, of course, this, this is... You can do it fairly quietly. You can draw quite a heavy bow, heavier than like uh, commercially made crossbows now. And um, sneaking around in the jungle, they thought it was a good idea. Didn't make very many of them because really um, warfare is not about individual prowess. It's about destroying as many things or people as you possibly can and making your enemy feel bad. Um, so these wonder, wonderful weapons are not usually of any great import. They developed all kinds of things. As I say, crossbows that shot harpoons, like um, big crossbow shooting harpoons, uh, preceded the, the kind of cannon that show, shoots harpoons that was, that's used in whaling ships. Um, crossbows that shot grapples, up to castle walls, so you could climb up the wall. Um, the, because the bolts can be made heavier, uh, you can make that kind of thing much more easily than you could with an, an arrow, even like a big longbow arrow, half an inch thick or whatever. You can really make one to use as a grapple, but you definitely can do it with uh, certain types of crossbow, very heavy ones. Yeah. There were... Um, Target crossbows, European target crossbows used in the First World War, converted into grenade launchers. Uh, and several of those, I think, were captured. So, uh, I, I, you know, it's even somebody, th there's this very weird research. Somebody, I think, during the First World War developed a kind of crossbow catapult for projecting grenades and things as well. They were so elaborate that they were too much trouble to use. But, you know, the idea didn't die out. Thank and you. Apparently, it's worldwide. I think the only place that didn't develop their own crossbows um, until European settlement were, were the uh, American continents in Australia, because in Australia, the Aborigines didn't see bows as anything other than toys. And the in South America, they use bows, obviously, and in North America, they use bows. But they um, their warfare wasn't bow oriented as much. I mean, you know, like. The Plains tribes, after the introduction of the horses by the Spaniards and that, started using bows a lot in warfare. But say, for instance, uh, the Aztecs used archers, but they were deeply into hacking people apart with machuapples and obsidian edge swords and things like this. So uh, you see, I have seen a film of a tribe in the Amazon where in hunting they use bows and arrows, and in warfare they use spear throwers and spears. <laughs> because it's insulting to shoot a person with an arrow. Yeah. You're treating him like an animal. So, <laughs> you know, the world is a very strange place. But getting back to the original thing, it were crossbows used in the Middle East, definitely. Uh, they were thought out. Uh, there, are, there are paintings in, in one of the manuscripts of Mardi. They've got paintings of crossbows built into shields. Uh, all kinds of um, wonderful devices that weren't very practical but really looked good on paper. Um, there's even, I'm pretty certain there's a type of giant crossbow, it's really a catapult, with uh, a um, rectangular frame, the crossbow is mounted in the frame, uh, the bow limbs uh, go over two ropes that go from the top to the bottom of the frame. So when you pull the bow back, the centre part of the limbs of the bow are supported by these ropes and extra torsion is got from the ropes pulling down and, and trying to compress the, um, the frame. Uh, so 
it's not they didn't just make crossbows but they developed the concept of crossbows there's even one catapult um that's shown that uses a crossbow as the device to trigger the release of the catapult because i think a, a lot of catapults um use mallets to strike something that released the trigger because there's so much force pent up say in a big trebuchet and um so this one they built a crossbow into it and the and the force of the crossbow releasing pulled the rope that released the trigger that shot the catapult again it, it was so part of the culture that people used it for all kinds of things Pete, thank you very much for this wonderful discussion. I really enjoyed it. Great input for everything and crossbows and for our viewers are going to appreciate it. Thank you very much. Would you like to add something to this today? Well, I, I'd just like to say that the, there's a lot of research to be done. There are archaeologists working in Iran and Turkey and Syria and that, that might be finding crossbow nuts and not know what they are yet. So, I mean, it's, it's good to encourage people that are working in the field to keep an eye out for these things because they're there. Yes. I mean, maybe there's not many of them because yes. they didn't survive, but they're there. And when you know what you're looking for, the, the, the classic thing, you look at uh, paleontologists and people like that, there's something that was collected 100 years ago. They go through the drawers trying to find something to write their thesis about and find a new species of dinosaur that had been sitting there for 100 years because nobody knew what it was. Well, the same thing happens in archaeology, that they discover things, and at the time of their discovery, they're not well written up because maybe it was in the 19th century, and they're not recognised for what they are. And we have those situations, as I was talking about, with, um, with Beveridge and this article on Oriental crossbows, where because there's so little information that even when they're reading a manuscript about it, they can mix up crossbows and arrow guides and things like that. Not their fault, but the more information we make available to academic and archaeologists and people studying literature and that, then the more likely they're to recognise important things that otherwise would be meaningless. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Pete. And then uh, soon we are going to have other discussion with Pete here on our channel. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, and see you soon. Bye bye. All right.